Get your Bibles out and go with me to Acts chapter number 17. This is the story of us. The title of this weekend's specific message is Revealing the Unknown God. Last time together, you remember the Apostle Paul was traveling. He was ministering the gospel in places like Thessalonica and then down in Berea. Persecution followed him, and so they sent him on ahead, and he went over to a place that we know of called Athens. Athens is a city of renown. In fact, to this day, we think about Athens. We think about all the things that started there, about how our modern-day education, how our modern-day government system of democracy, how it had its roots and its foundations here in this place called Athens. Art, philosophy, language, education, all these things have deep roots in this city. Even our language does. Men of renown like Aristotle, Socrates, Plato, all spoke and taught in this place. But one historian pointed out about Athens that it was easier to find a god than it was to find a man in Athens. I've heard estimations that in uh, that time there may have been around 10,000 people living in Athens and there was 20,000 carved images of gods all over the place. Now, whether that's true or not, I don't know. But what I do know is that the Bible confirms that and reinforces this thought that this place had a whole lot of confusion about who God is. And it says that in a city filled with gods that they missed the one true and living God. Acts chapter 17, starting in verse number 16, we're going to read down through verse number 18. Let's take a look at it together in Acts chapter 17, starting in verse number 16. It says, now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. Verse 17, therefore, he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshipers and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. Now, Paul was supposed to be being a good boy at this time because he had just left one place persecuted, and then he preached the gospel, and the persecution came to that place also, and they had to send him on ahead, and they said, wait for us in Athens. So here Paul is all by himself, and every time he preaches the gospel, it seems like persecution starts up. People get mad. People get angry. People try and beat him up. People throw him out of town. But here he is all by himself. He doesn't have his safety team with him, will, with him, if you will. He doesn't have Timothy. He doesn't have Silas. He doesn't have the Dr. Luke that's writing about all this stuff. It's just Paul by himself. And so he's taken in the sights, taken in the sounds of the city. But he can't. Why? Because he sees all the idols all around him, and he's just grieved on the inside. He's provoked. The Bible says there's like a painful process. He, he's stirred. He's angry about it. My goodness, this shouldn't be. They need to know who God is. And so Paul does what Paul does. And he goes to the synagogue, and he starts to reason with the Jews and the Gentile worshipers there in the synagogue, teaching that Jesus is the Christ. But he didn't just go there on Saturdays and that's it. No, in the marketplace daily. He's going after the Greeks. He's going after the Athenians. He's going after all the people that are traveling through this town of well-renown, and he's trying to tell them about the one who's famous. His name is Jesus. Verse number 18, then certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him, and some said, what does this babbler want to say? Others said he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. Now, it could be that they thought he was trying to introduce two new gods that they didn't know about. In fact, if you read on in the Scriptures, it says that the people of Athens had nothing better to do than sit around all day and just talk about the latest, greatest, newest thing, new concepts, new reasoning, new gods, whatever that was. It sounds a lot like some people that we know, right? There's there's whole platforms committed to these things called Twitter and Instagram and Facebook and Parler and the news channels that you see, Fox News, CNN, NBC, MSNBC, right? All they're doing is sitting around talking about the latest and greatest news. Oh, my goodness. Not a lot has changed in thousands of years. So here they say, what does this babbler want to say? But notice there were Epicurean and Stoic philosophers. We don't really know too much about that. The Epicureans were curious people. See, they thought that their chief good was pleasure. And so they would give themselves completely to their feelings, a lot like when many of you guys studied ancient Greece, the hedonists, right? But they didn't go that far. It wasn't quite that level. They were just giving themselves, if it felt good, they did it, right? They were all about their feelings. But the Stoics were different. The Stoic philosophy was that the chief good was virtue. They also concluded that you cannot know virtue if you are emotionally involved, so they threw out all feelings. They were influenced by a group of people called the cynics. Maybe you know some cynics in your neighborhood too, right? Maybe they're in your family. Maybe they're next to you. Don't look at them right now, okay? But one group felt everything and one group felt nothing. 
One was caught up in pleasure, the other one was caught up in pride. And here Paul is in the center trying to bring them together to the knowledge of the one true and living God. But they look at him like a babbler. They say, what's he trying to do? He's trying to introduce new gods? They might have thought that he might have been trying to do, introduce two gods, Jesus and the resurrection. You say, that's weird. Why would they say that the resurrection is God? Because they had the God of fertility, the God of love, the God of war, right? They had all these gods, all these different gods. So they might have thought Jesus was one God and the resurrection was another. And they weren't really listening to what he was saying. They were just kind of saying, what is this guy doing? You know, it's just something new. And they didn't really like him. They, you know, this little Jewish man probably looked a little rough and rugged. Uh, they didn't really think too much of him. And in the Amplified Version of Acts chapter 17, verse 18, it says that the philosophers criticized Paul, and they use this term, saying that he was a scrap heap learner. A scrap heap learner. And it's from that word babbler. That word babbler in the original language was talking about a little bird that would hop along the ground. And as he hopped along, he would peck at sand, and he would peck at little stones until he found a little seed that he could eat. The same word is used in classical Greek literature of people who would go about the city and they would find things that they could pick up off the ground, little scraps here and there. Maybe a, a cart was going with some goods somewhere, maybe an apple, maybe an orange, that sort of thing, and it would hit a bump on the ground and some apples would fall and they would come and they would grab those things and they would take them with them and then they would go and sell them for a profit in the market. And that's how they made their living. So they say that Paul is somebody just gathering up little things here and there. He's got a little bit of Jewish philosophy, it sounds like, and maybe he's got some of that Hindu stuff with the resurrection. I've heard about that somewhere else before. And Maybe he's got a little bit of the Greek and a little bit of this and a little bit of that. What is this scrap heap learner? What is this babbler trying to say? But what they didn't realize is that the scrap heap of God is greater than the wisdom of this world because the Bible tells us that the foolishness of God is wiser than the wisdom of man. And the scrap heap of God is better than the best, latest, and greatest ideas of men. But it comes throughout this story that they get a hold of Paul, and they say, we want to hear you talk about this subject. And so they bring him to this place called the Areopagus. Now, I'm probably murdering that word in the Greek, all right? But you don't speak Greek, and neither do I, so we're all just going to roll with it, okay? Here on the overhead, you see a picture. Many of us know the Acropolis. Many of us know the, the Parthenon that had all the gods up here on the top right. Now, looking down from that place, Dr. Kobernik, uh, when he was in Greece a couple years back, took this picture in the center here. Now, in the center, see on the right-hand side, see how there's that cropping of rock right there? That is the Areopagus, also known as Mars Hill. It was open air. It was like an amphitheater. And the whole city would come out, and, and they actually had Areopagites that were guys that would come, and they would listen to these ideas. They would consider what was going on. And if there was a new God being introduced, they would either accept them into their regular routine worship, or they would reject that God, and they wouldn't worship that God. So here Paul is taking his stand in front of these people, in front of this council. In fact, this is the same place. The reason why it's called Mars Hill is because that was the god of war. And they had tribunal and judges there. They actually tried Aristotle at that place and condemned him to death and murdered him. This is that same place, but now it's more about ideas. And either they were going to let that idea live or they were going to kill it. And so Paul takes his stand there on the Areopagus, on Mars Hill, in front of all of the leaders, in front of this council, and he tells them about God. He reveals to them who God is. Let's read about it in Acts chapter 17, verse number 23, this time in the New King James Version. We're reading from Acts chapter 17, verse number 23. Paul is ministering to them, and he starts, and he says, I can tell you guys are very religious. Verse 23, for as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you. And the apostle Paul, this guy is a master communicator. Think about this for a second. He's in the midst of a bunch of people who don't have the scriptural background that the Jews have. He had already ministered in the synagogue, and he would reason with them from the Scriptures, but these people didn't know the Scriptures. They didn't know the background. They didn't know the history. They didn't know about the Lamb of God. They didn't know about the sacrificial system. All they had was their context in their life, and rather than bash them and say, you guys got it all wrong. You're worshiping everything. My goodness, are you kidding me? He doesn't do that. He doesn't bash them over the head or break out a scroll with a Scripture and say, look at this. This is where it's at. You guys are just stupid. No, he doesn't dismiss them. He doesn't insult them. What does he do? He compliments them. I can tell you guys are very religious. And in fact, while I was considering the objects of your worship, I actually found a place of worship that had this inscription to the unknown God. Now, these guys would have known about that. 
In fact, there was a famous story about uh, a plague that broke out in ancient Greece. And when the plague broke out, they tried everything. They sacrificed all the gods that they could think of, and nothing worked. And finally, one guy said, hey, just let some sheep loose in a field, and wherever they lay down, sacrifice the sheep at that place to the unknown god. Maybe there's some that we missed. Maybe you're offending them by not worshiping them. And so wherever they go, you sacrifice them there, and that'll be the place that you will appease that god. Well, they did that. The plague ended up uh, ending, and they thought, well, there you go. That's the solution. So they said, just in case we offend anybody, we're going to sacrifice to the unknown God so they can't be mad at us. Paul says, I see that, and whom you worship without knowing him, I declare to you. They would have known that, and at that point, they all would have leaned in and said, oh, this guy knows something we don't know. Remember, they're sitting around with nothing better to do than hear new ideas. And Paul says, I'm going to give you a revelation right now. I'm going to open up something that you guys have done with ignorance, but now you're going to know what's happening. Paul goes on to preach the gospel in a short form that the TED Talks of today would gush over. And in his short message, he reveals the God that they all had missed. And I believe that in our nation, in these days that we are living in, in this time and in this season, that people are just kind of bouncing around doing whatever feels good. They're a lot like the Epicureans, many of them just living for pleasure. Everything's about their feelings. If it feels good, if I'm going to do it. If it doesn't feel good, I'm not going to do it. So many people are so feeling-led and feeling-oriented that if I don't feel like you talk to me the right way, then you're not my friend, and I'm not going to listen to you because that didn't really feel too right. I feel like I'm going to vote for this person because I feel that they're pretty good. I feel like that's how it is, but I feel like that person's very mean, and so I'm not going to vote for them. It doesn't matter their platform or what they... Uh, approve of or that. I I just feel this way, right? I feel like I'm going to go have lunch afterwards, and if I don't feel good about lunch, then I'm not going to eat lunch, right? And it's like, what are you doing? Either you're hungry or you're not. Either you're going to eat or you're not. Like, like, let's get feelings out of this, and let's move on with life. But then other people are like the Stoics, right? They're indifferent. They're prideful. They don't care. Life passes them by, and they could care less. I'm just going to do me. I'm just going to be over here. I'll be right here, right? Y'all can be crazy, and I'll just be right here. And they don't feel anything. They're not moved by anything. There's no compassion. They've closed up their hearts. And in the midst of this, the church should be right at the forefront saying, hey, you guys are missing God, and I want to reveal this unknown God to you today. You can come, and you can know who God is. You can experience his power. You can have all the feels, and you can also know that he is God. So how is God revealed? How is God revealed? We need to know this in order that we can reveal this unknown God to a lost and dying generation. How is God revealed? First thing is this, is that creation reveals the Creator. We see this in Paul's message there on Mars Hill. He reveals that creation reveals the Creator. Let's take a look at it together in Acts chapter 17, this time verse number 24 and verse number 25. Verse 24 says this, this is God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. Right there, he says that God is the creator. He reveals him as the one who started it all. He is the original cause. He is the one who started everything. He's the creator, and he made everything, the heavens and the earth. It's all the Lord. And he says, he does not dwell in temples made with hands. Now, right there, he just knocked over their whole little house of cards. (laughs) Just blew, blew it right over. Why? Because they've got temples all around them. Remember, there's this big old temple right here with all the gods. There's temples uh, of different gods all around them. In fact, from that Mars Hill, they probably could have taken a stone and knocked three different temples from right where they were at. But he says God is so big, and God is the creator, that God doesn't dwell in temples made with hands. Look at the next verse, number 25. Nor is he worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. God is the creator. One boy one time was thinking he was so smart, he came home after school and he says, Mom, I believe in evolution. I'm not a Christian anymore. I'm an atheist. She says, is that so? He says, yeah. She says, well, then how was the earth made? He says, no one made it. It just happened. She said, hmm, and she left. Next morning, the boy wakes up, family scattered around the house. Breakfast is made. It's on the table. It's beautiful. It's piping hot. He is just so happy about this. He steps up to the side of the table, looks around. He goes, who made breakfast? And his mom peeks around the corner. She says, no one made it. It just happened. See, I have a hard time when somebody tells me that there is no creator. 
Because when I look around the earth, I see that there are intelligent systems. I see that there are symbiotic systems. I see that there's intelligent design in everything. My goodness, we can't even make a camera that works as good as the human eye. And you're going to tell me that evolved? You're going to tell me that just happened? I don't think so. You're going to tell me the fact that we breathe out carbon dioxide and plants take that in and then they put out oxygen that we take in. You think that that just happened? I look at the, the sky, I look at the systems, I look at the moon phases and how it affects the, the earth systems and the, the oceans and how all these things take place and how it's all working together, even the food chain. And you're going to tell me that was happenstance and chance? You've got to have more faith to believe that than to believe that an almighty God came outside of our time, space, and reality, and in his might and in his power, breathed in the planets existed, spoke and the world was made, spoke and light came to be, sat down and drew out a man and breathed the breath of God into him. Someone's trying to make a monkey out of you. Don't let them. This thing was intelligently designed. Can I just tell you one of the things that just gets on my last nerve? Is that okay? Can I, can I just reveal my pet peeve to you guys? Can I get on a little rant, a little soapbox talk for a second? Is that all right? Okay. Because here's the deal. I drive around, and as I'm going to my house, I see in people's yards these little signs, we believe, and then they lay out all this stuff that they believe. A lot of it's foolishness. Because I know it's foolishness. You say, Pastor, how do you know? Why are you judging? Here's the reason why. I can judge what is spiritual. The Bible says that I can judge all things, all right? So I'm judging right now, all right? The Bible says so. So here I'm looking at this, and as I'm reading, it says, we believe in science. No, you don't. You say, what do you mean, no, you don't? Here's the reason why you don't believe in science. And I've got two scientists that teach in the school system sitting right here, so they're going to check my facts for, this, for, for a minute, all right? The law, not the theory, the law of conservation of matter and of energy. Doctor, doctor, can you guys tell me if this is true or not? In any transaction cannot create or destroy matter. Is that true? Is that true? Is that what the law says? What's the law state? Come on, Teresa, tell me the truth. Don't lie in church. Matter can be neither created nor destroyed. So you're going to tell me that in any transaction, right? So they're saying atoms were floating. Wait, wait, wait. Where'd the atoms come from? I'm sorry. Oh, it started with the Big Bang. No, it didn't. It had to start before that because if you've got atoms, then something created those atoms. Something would have to start that cause and they would have to then slam together. The only bang I see is that God said it and bang, it happened. That's it. Because matter cannot be created or destroyed. It has to come from somewhere. That means there had to be a supernatural outside of our systems, outside of our reality that stepped in and caused it to happen. And God is the creator of all that. That means that when we see creation, we should see the creator and we're left without an excuse. In fact, this is what the book of Romans has to say in Romans chapter 1, verse 19 and 20. I'm going to read this to you in the New Living Translation. It says, they know the truth about God because he has made it obvious to them. Verse 20, for ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature. Some of your translations say they can see the Godhead. That means Father, Son, and Holy Spirit can be seen in creation. So when someone comes and asks, well, what about the heathen who has never heard the name of Jesus? What if, if no one ever preached to them, you're going to tell me that your God is going to condemn them to hell? They're going to die and go to hell never having heard the name of Jesus? What about them? They're without excuse. Why? Because through nature, through creation, the fact that there is a creation means that there was a creator. They can see God, and they can see Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in the things that are revealed in creation. Look at this. His eternal power and divine nature so that they have no excuse for not knowing God. Amen. We're without excuse. God says, I'm revealing myself. I'm right here. You want to see me? Go take a look at what I've created. You can see my divine nature. You can see my power. You can see my attributes. You can see Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We're all going to stand before God and give an account, and no one will be able to say, I didn't know. No, you knew. You just denied it. And when you deny it, in fact, this week, if you want to read through Romans chapter number one for a little extra credit, not with me or the church or with God, with yourself. You want to read through what happens when you deny God? Just read the rest of Romans chapter number one. Just read from 20 on, all right? And see what happens when you deny God. It's not a good thing. It's not a good place. So how is God revealed? Number one, creation reveals the creator. But God doesn't stop there. 
God wants to take us into deeper levels of revelation. And so, second thing is this, is that humanity reveals the Father and His love. Humanity reveals the Father and His love. Speaking of fathers, there was a father and son that were out in the fields with the hay, and they were baling hay, and as they brought the bales together, they were rolling it up and just making these big piles of it. And so they started to load it on the back of a tractor, and they had a cart that they put it on the back of. So as they're taking this tractor along, the dad said, you know what, son, you've been practicing on the tractor. I'm going to actually let you drive home th- today. This is your first time. You're old enough. I think you're good enough for the tractor. I'm going to let you drive home. And the son was just like so excited. And so he jumped on the tractor and took off, and he kept go- going down the street. And down, there was a downhill with a bend right next to a house, and he got going a little bit too fast, got a little too close to the the fence, and so he jerked the wheel, and my goodness, that back cart turned right over and spilled all the hay right off the back of the cart. It made a loud crash, and the boy jumped down, he said, oh, no, no, father's going to be so angry, father's going to be so angry, what am I going to do? The man in the house came running out, and he said, son, son, calm down, calm down. What are you, what are we, what's going on? I, I can see there's an accident. Oh, father's going to be so angry. Father's going to be so angry. He said, oh, hey, listen, settle down, settle down. We'll take care of it. We'll get this loaded back up. No problem. Father's going to be so angry. Oh, my goodness. Father's going to be so angry. He says, hold on, hold on. Listen, I've got lunch on the table. I've got enough to share. Why don't you come in? We'll calm you down. We'll get you some lunch. Then we'll come out after we've settled down. We'll tackle this together, all right? Kid, father's going to be so angry. He takes him inside, sits him down. They have lunch together. The, the, the boy calms down, has lunch. They get up. They clean up. They come back outside and get ready, and he sees the pile of hay, and the boy goes right back into it. Oh, father's going to be so angry. Father's going to be so angry. He says, listen, son, where is your dad? He goes, under the hay. The Apostle Paul reveals that humanity shows us the Father and His love. Acts chapter 17, verse number 26 through verse number 20. If you're looking for how that ties in, it doesn't. It's just funny, all right? Acts chapter 17, verse 26. And He is made from one blood, every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth. If you were looking in the news, you would see division, black, white, brown, Asian, islander, all these different things, native people versus non-natives. People are dividing over their flesh. And yet right here in the scriptures, it's been there all along. God says you are not divided, you are united. There's not a bunch of different races. There's one race, it's the human race. There's one blood that God has made all nations to come from. We all trace our roots back to Noah and Adam and Eve. So what are we splitting over the flesh over? Stop it, church. Stop it, Christians. That's fleshly. That's carnal. That's feelings-based. Let's get off of those things. But look at he goes on to talk about something else, too, and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. This is a hot topic right now. They should give the land back. They should make reparations. They should be paying people for this stuff. Look at what they did. They took this people out of their land. They put these people into their land. They did all this stuff. Man, they're so terrible. They're so awful. But listen, guys, the Bible says God is in the midst of all that. You remember there used to be a nation called Prussia? Where is that today? They gone, right? Now there's Poland, there's Germany, right? There's all these different places. There's Russia, there's Ukraine, there's all these different nations. Used to be Czechoslovakia. Now it's not. It's Yugoslavia, right? And and you got the Slavic Republic. Now you've got uh, uh, Czech Republic. You've got all these different places. Uh, Slovenia, all these different places around there. Why? Well, they should give that back. You think so? Or how about this? We move forward with God. Because the Scripture goes on to reveal the reason why God does all this. I'm very quiet in this place, by the way. Hopefully you're forming beliefs based on what the Word of God has to say. He has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. Why? Why would God do that? Why, God? Why war? Why plagues? Why famines? Why pestilence? Why injustice, God? Verse 27, so that they should seek the Lord. See, if everything was peachy keen, if everything was so wonderful and so copacetic, we would just sit back and we'd forget about God. Why? Because what do I need God for? I'm good. And we would continue like the Epicureans to seek pleasure. 
Be like the Stoics, indifferent to the things of God. But when pressure comes on, when the pain comes on, you know, last year I saw a lot of people fall away from God, but last year I also saw a church rise up and seek God and press into God. This is a passionate place. People are saying, I got to have God. It's so bad out there that if I don't get God, it ain't going to happen. So that they might seek The Lord, in the hope that they might grope for him and find him. You know, God is not playing hide and seek. He's playing sardines. He wants to hang out. God wants you to find him so you can be with him. Wow. Look at this, though he's not far from each one of us. Do you know God is everywhere all at once? God fills the heavens and the earth. There's no place you can go from his presence. He is omnipresent. He's everywhere at all times. He was there in the middle of the night in your bedroom when you were crying out. You've been beat up, molested, hurt, betrayed. God knew. God was there collecting your tears in his vial and writing them in his book. Every inward thought, every moment of every hour, everything that you're ashamed of and everything that you can rejoice in, God was there rejoicing with you. God was weeping over your sin. God was hoping and encouraging and Blessing. God was framing your life. God put you in this place at this time. Why? That you might grope for Him, that you might feel around, not just be led by your things, but that you might feel for God, that you might start to seek God, that you would look for Him, that that hole on the inside of you would draw you to Him. God reveals in humanity that if we are a people, if we are His children, if we are all one, then guess what? We have a Father, and if there is a Father, then there is a love that He has for His children. Because God is a good God, and He is a good Father. He's not like the fathers we may have known on the earth. Look at what it says. It says, for in Him we live and move and have our being, verse 28. As also some of your own poets have said, for we are also His offspring. See, Paul, once again, masterfully, he doesn't quote the Scriptures. He quotes their poets. Why? Because they didn't respect the Scriptures. They respected their poets. And he says, you're going to know what I'm saying is true because there's people that you respect that I'm about ready to quote right now. Wow. He has their attention. He has their interest. If there's a creation, then there's a creator. There's a God who made it all. And if there's a people on the earth, then there has to be a father. And that father loves you. Why? Because we are his offspring. But the problem is, is that even though we can see these things about God, even though we understand these things, God made us all to seek him. And the motivation for his making us was love. God is love. Therefore, His activities flow from love, and He wants relationship. But even though we can see that, we also can see that sin breaks relationship. And that brings us to the next revelation of God is that our sin reveals our need of a Savior. Therefore, God, as a good Father who loves us, wouldn't leave us in the condition that we were in. He had to do something about that condition because we couldn't get ourselves out of it. We couldn't work our way into it. We couldn't earn this on our own. We couldn't make it on our own. Our sin reveals our need of a Savior. Acts chapter 17, verse number 29 through verse number 30. Look at what it says. It says, therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone or something shaped by art and man's devising. Everybody say man's devising. Oh, you guys fell asleep on me. Come on. Everybody say say it with me online too. Everybody say man's devising. See, we can think of things. We can stir up things. We can make things up on our own. This is how it ought to be. This is how it ought to go. I think that I should be saved because I'm a really good person. I'm not as bad as the guy next to me. Man, they're the filthy rot that they're going to go to hell, but not me. Why? Because I've been good enough. I've been smart enough. I'm nice enough. I'm pretty enough. I've done a lot. I, you know, I've had enough bad. I don't think God's going to be bad at the end of all this. Oh, all roads lead to heaven, isn't it? No. No. See, God is not worshipped that way. God is not approached that way. We cannot come up with our own schemes and our own devising. Verse 30, truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. See, in some circles in our society, repentance is a dirty word. But repentance is not a dirty word. It is a beautiful word. Repentance means this. It means that I had a way that I was going. I was going this way. Man, I was into my own thing. I was into my own feelings. I was being led by that. Or maybe I was indifferent to the things of God, even though I knew better. I said, no, I'm going to do me. And I was going this way. But then the Word of God revealed to me. It came to me. 
And I had a change of heart and change of mind, and I came to myself, and I realized, you know what, this is wrong. This is not where I need to be. And as I had that change, I also changed direction. I turned 180 degrees from my way, and I turned, and I went God's way. That is biblical repentance. Repentance is not a dirty word. It's something that we as Christians should be doing every time we find that we're going the wrong way. Because we will all stumble in many things, the Bible says. But we need to realize, you know what? This is wrong. This is not for me. This lie, this being emotionally led or this being indifferent to the things of God, I can't continue on that path. I've got to go God's way, and we turn from our way, and we start heading towards Jesus once again. That is biblical repentance. It's not our scheming. It's God's way. When we decide for ourselves what's good and what is evil, we end up in sin, and we miss God's way. There's a story of four men in India who had special abilities. People told them not to use them. People told them not to do it. One guy had the ability that if he could find a bone, then he could create a skeleton. Another guy said, well, I I can't do that, but if I have a skeleton, then I can put flesh on it. Another man said, that's great. If I have the flesh on it, then I can put the hair and the eyes and the nails and all that kind of stuff on it. The last man said, well, if you have a completed body, then I can animate it. And so here they all came together one time the people told them, don't do this. You don't know what's going to happen. They warned them of it. And they went out into the forest there in northern India. They went out, and the first man found a bone, and he created a full skeleton. Second guy came along, and he took that skeleton, and he put the flesh on it. Last guy came up, and with the flesh, he put the hair and the nails and the eyes and all that on it. And finally, the last guy animated it. And that form, that original bone was from a tiger, and that tiger came to life, and it attacked all four of those men, and it killed them. Guys, if we play with our sin, if we do things in our own power, in our own strength, if we continue with our own devising, our sin will kill us. Death is separation, right? When I die, my spirit lives on, but I am separated from this physical, natural body. But my spirit is eternal, it's immortal, and I will live on. And we will all live on, and we will all go into eternity. And we will either end up in heaven, or we will end up in hell. And if I stay in unrepentant sin, and I go my way, I will end up in hell. But if I continue on the path that God has, if I repent and turn from my way, and I go God's way, then I can end up in heaven. That is the end of all men. You can either accept it or reject it, but you cannot change it. That's the way that God outlines for us in the Scripture. Because the last revelation that we find this weekend in this short sermon from the Apostle Paul is that the end reveals the righteous judge. If there is a beginning, there will be an ending. If there was a start, there will be a finish. And we know that there's coming a day when all of this natural stuff will be wrapped up. We'll hear the trumpet sound and fervent heat will melt all of the elements. And we will all go before the judgment seat of Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 17, verse number 31. Let's take a look at the end of this sermon. It says this, because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. Right there we see the Son of God. Because if we went before God on our own, and if God never sent Jesus, we'd be able to say, well, God, why are you punishing us? God, why would you send us to hell? You don't know what it's like. You've never been a man. You don't know the weakness and the frailty of our being. You don't know what it's like to be tempted to sin. No one could stand up under that. So what does God do? God saw us in our need. God saw us in the pit that we couldn't get ourselves out of. God saw us in sin doing our own thing, indifferent to his ways and being led by our feelings. And God said, I can't leave them in that pit. I can't have them going to hell. I want relationship. I'm their father and I love them. So what does he do in our sinful state? He sends Jesus. He breaks him from his side. He wraps him in flesh. Jesus comes, God in the flesh, and he lives the perfect, spotless, sinless life. He lives among us as a man. He endures the temptations and the frailties of man. He learns obedience by the things which he suffered, and he suffers, and he's wrongly, falsely accused, prosecuted, tried, judged, condemned, and he goes to a cross that was meant for you and was meant for me. And Jesus on that cross takes the penalty and the punishment for the sin of humanity, past, present, and future, and he bears the weight of sin and shame and guilt, and he takes it upon himself, and Jesus dies. But he didn't stay dead. He was raised again to life on the third day. Why? Because that death was an unlawful death. He didn't do anything wrong. Therefore, in raising again, he broke the power that death had on humanity. 
and he broke the power of sin off of all of us. It says that he ordained that man. He has given assurance to all of this by raising him from the dead. The resurrection is how we receive that eternal life. It's how we know that judgment is passed over us. Why? Because if it's on Jesus, then it's off of us. If the wrath of God was poured out on Jesus for our sin, if we are in Christ, then the wrath of God has been satisfied in Christ for our payment and for our punishment, for our sin. Really, there were three groups of people that we can see that Paul addressed from the synagogue to standing on Mars Hill. Yes, there was the people of the marketplace, the general population, but three specific groups of people. There were the Jews, the Epicureans, and the Stoics. We would say of an are they that they were the self-righteous. The Jews were trying to seek God based on their good works, trying to uphold the law, and they were following that way, but it was all from self, from what they could earn and what they could do. The second was the carnal. Those Epicureans going after pleasure, it was all about how they felt, all about what they could do to please themselves. And finally, the indifferent, the Stoics just sat by, and they were prideful, and they couldn't be moved. They couldn't do anything. They were past feeling. But Jesus is the answer for all three of these groups. You cannot enter the kingdom without the resurrection power of the king. It can't be based on your own righteousness like the Jews. It has to be based on the righteousness of God that Jesus came and lived the perfect life on your behalf. Where you couldn't do it, God can. Where you fell short, God reached out. Where you fell down, God lifted you up. It has to be in Jesus. The carnal are called to repent. It's time to turn from our sinful ways. It's time to turn from pleasing ourselves or whatever just feels good. And it's time to go after God because God is just and God is right. And if you will please God, you will have great joy in this life than any pleasing of yourself could have. And finally, the indifferent are called to wake up. Why? Because there is coming a day when the righteous judge will come and he will judge all those on the face of the earth. The sea will get up the dead in them. Death and Hades will come and give up their dead. And we will all go before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account of our works, whether good or whether of evil. Today, I'm going to ask everybody to remain seated. The Spirit of God is moving in this place right now, and God wants to speak to you about your eternal life. Don't log off online. Let the fear of God just keep you right there and listen up because God wants to speak to you right now. You've heard the good news of the gospel. You've heard the fact that you cannot earn your way into it. Religion can't do it. I don't care if you were raised in church, your parents told you were Christians growing up, hung a cross or St. Christopher around your neck, had you baptized or christened as a child. You wore religious jewelry, you went to religious classes, Sunday school, Sabbath school, catechism class, cleaned up your act, used to be bad, but now you're good. You cannot earn your way into the kingdom of God. God says that no flesh shall glory in my presence. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You can't be bad enough to keep you out, but you also can't be good enough to earn your way in. It has to be on Jesus' life, his ministry for you at the cross. Not going to earn your way into heaven. Not going to make it that way. Can't be based on your scripture memorization, being able to sing a song at Christmas, celebrating Easter. That's not going to make it to heaven. You can't be led by your feelings. Well, pastor, this feels really mean to me. You, you sound angry, pastor. I'm not angry. I'm passionate for your soul. And the love of God is flowing through me. But love doesn't play patty cake and play games and just say, oh, I'm sorry that that feels so bad. Why don't you go do, go mess around in your sin and die and go to hell? That's not love. That'd be like me telling my kids, oh, you want to play on the freeway? It's okay. I love you. And then they end up on some little pancake under a big wheel's tire. That's not love. Love says, hey, stay off the freeway. That's not the place for you to play. The same way love says, hey, you can't just do whatever you want to do and expect to go to heaven. Not all roads lead to heaven. Contrary to what popular culture would have you to believe. Wide is the path that leads to destruction, and many people are on it. There's going to be a lot of people headed for hell. Narrow is the path that leads to life, and there are few who find it. Today, can I shine some light on the path for you? But there are those of you in this place and those of you online that you're listening and you're indifferent. Maybe you were raised in church. Maybe you heard this gospel message before. Maybe you've had all the feels, and now the feels are gone. And you're one of the frozen chosen, just sitting there. Eh, it's cool. I'm all right. It's fine. God knows me. God alone is my judge. What are you going to do about it? You've got that chip on your shoulder and that attitude. Guys, I'm not here to knock the chip off. I'm not here to address any of that. I'm just here to love you and tell you the truth. But if you sit there indifferent to this message, salvation will have passed you by. You're going to miss God. 
just like the Athenians did. End up looking everywhere else for God, worshiping the creation rather than creator. God is calling you home today. Today is your day of salvation. Today is your day to respond to this message of the gospel, the good news that Jesus Christ bore your sin. You're in need of a Savior. You need Him. Whether you think you do or not, you need Him. There's no other way of salvation. Jesus said, except you be born again, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. You can't get there your way, my way, some well-meaning church committee's way. You must be born again. That's God's way. Being born again simply means this. It means that you have surrendered all of your heart and all of your life to Jesus Christ. Lay down your life before Him at the cross. You take up His life, a new life, committed to following Him for the rest of your days, learning His ways, learning His truth. Will you mess up? Yeah, we all do. Repent. Keep going with God. Will it be easy? Absolutely not. Every pressure, every trial will come against you trying to stop you. But that's where it pushes you to seek God. But it'll be the best decision of your entire life. In fact, eternally, it will be the best decision. Today is your day of salvation. Whether you've been in church all your life, maybe this is your first time to church, whether you've watched online for a long time, or maybe this is your first time, God is speaking to you. You need to give God all of your heart, and you need to give God all of your life, surrendering everything to Him. In a moment, I'm going to count to three just like this. One, two, three. And when I say three, I'm going to pop my hand on the microphone. Bang! Just like that. When you hear the sound of my hand popping on the microphone, bang! That's your opportunity to simply raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying something. You're saying, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it, and you can put it right back down. You might be sitting there thinking, whoa, 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 wait a second. Time out, Pastor. Ooh, if I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Yeah, you might be embarrassed. That's okay. Let's think of the trade-off. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to end up in hell forever and ever and ever and ever? Listen, you land in hell, you'd raise both arms, both legs. You're under a flagpole if you could. But there are no exits in hell. The Bible says it's appointed for man once to die and then to the judgment. You're not coming back as a dog or a frog working your way back up into a human. And eventually you get another go at this. You've got this life to live. You've got this moment. You've got this time. God is speaking to you right now. You need to surrender all of your heart. You need to surrender all of your life to Jesus Christ. Today is your day of salvation. Don't be bashful. Don't be shy. Listen, you're amongst the family of God. We love you. God loves you. That's why he sent Jesus beaten, bloody, and hung on a cross. And Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess to you before my Father who's in heaven. But he says, if you deny me, I will deny you. Today, your call, your choice. You can sit there and do nothing. Be indifferent like a stoic. That's your call. Jesus says, when you go before him, he's going to do the same. Or how about this? You can surrender to God all of your heart and all of your life. Whether you have all the feels right now or not, doesn't matter. You know the truth. God has placed eternity in the hearts of men, and you realize and recognize that God is revealing himself to you today. And you need to come. Give God all of your heart and all of your life. He will confess you before his Father if you confess him before man. I'll see your hand go up if you're alive. You can put it right back down. Online, maybe your family will see your friends that you're there with. They'll see it. That's okay. My goodness, they're excited for you too. Maybe they need to see you so that they can have the boldness and the courage to raise their hand as well. You say, Pastor, I'm watching online all by myself. No one sees me. No one's around. Hey, listen, God sees you. God's watching right now. You can get your hand up and then put it right back down. Who should raise their hand? If you've been running from God instead of two, God, I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Make sure today. Who should raise their hand if you've never done this before, never yet given your heart and life to Jesus Christ? I'm speaking to you. Or finally, who should raise their hand in a safe and friendly place in a moment? If you're lukewarm, half-hearted, you know that's the condition of your heart when I describe it. Maybe you're apathetic, maybe you're on the fence, that sort of a thing. Jesus said, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, he says, I'll vomit from my mouth. That shows me half-hearted, apathetic, lukewarm Christianity is not real Christianity at all. This is not a religious ritual. This is not just something that we go through the motions and earn brownie points with God. This has to be all. All means all. All of your heart and all of your life. If that's you, in any of those categories I just mentioned, get ready to get your hands up if you need to on the count of three. Here we go. You ready? Ready online? Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Just raise them up high right now. There's one, two. Thank you. There's three back there. Gotcha. Who else today? There's three. There's four. Yeah, shot it up. There's five. Gotcha. Thank you. God bless you on this side. Who else today? There's five. There's six over here. Yeah, gotcha. Thank you. God bless you. Who else today? There's seven. Yes, thank you. God bless you. Anybody else? Come on. I didn't embarrass them, and I won't embarrass you. If you need to do this, come on, get your hand up high right now if that's you. Is there anybody else? Yeah, eight. Gotcha. 
Right on. Good call. Good call. Anybody else real quick? Just want to make sure. Want to make sure there's eight wise people already. If you're sitting there wondering if you should do this, yeah, you should. Come on, let's go for God today. Let's go for God. Is there anybody else? There's eight wise people already. Come on, number nine. Maybe number nine, you're sitting there, your heart's about ready to beat out of your chest, broke out in a cold sweat, and you're hoping I'd shut up. Hey, you need to get your hand up. Is there another one up there? Thank you. Number nine. Come on, number 10. Number 10, I just know that you're there. Just get that hand up right now if that's you. Spirit of God is moving on your heart. Where they at? Number 10, give me a little wave if I don't see you. Anybody else real quick? Just want to make sure. Just want to make sure. Come on, if that's you. Anybody else? You're still going over here. My goodness, I don't see him yet. There you are. Ah, oh, gotcha. Got you right there. Okay. Wonderful number 10. Praise God. We're excited for you. Let's give the Lord a praise today for 10 wise people. And we don't know how many online, but my goodness, we're excited for you, life in Jesus Christ. Let's all stand to our feet. If you raised your hand or you should have raised your hand, but you didn't, it's not too late. Get a hold of your cold purse sweater, Bible, friend of you, your friend. Once you get in the aisle and meet me up front, we're going to change destinies together today. If you got a mask, throw it on. If you don't, still come, all right? We've got plenty of room to spread out up here. We'll do this safely. Just come right now. If you raised your hand or you should have raised your hand, come on down. Come on down. Let's give them a hand as they come. Let's pray together. Come on down. Online, why don't you stand to your feet right now with us as a symbol that you're going before God. Come on, let's give them a hand as they come. They're coming. Come on, let's keep it going for them. Let's keep it going for them. If you need to come, just come to the front right now. Come on down. Come on down. They're still coming. Come on. You can come too. This is your time. This is your moment. From the family rooms, if you need to bring your kids down, they're welcome. They will remember this. Come on right now. Come on down. Come on down. Come on, they're still coming. You can come too. Come on. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Hallelujah. Thank God you guys have come. We're excited for your new life in Jesus Christ. This is the best decision of your entire life. In fact, of your eternal life as well. Right here, right now. I know that's like weighty and heavy, but my goodness, good for you guys. I'm so excited for you guys. I'm so excited for those of you that are joining us online and you're standing at your feet right now and you're ready to receive Jesus as your Lord and as your Savior. I'm going to lead you all in a prayer, and those of you online as well, to give God all of your heart and give God all of your life. You're going to be born again, headed for heaven, brand new on the inside. God's going to do a miracle. I don't know how he does that, but he does it. You get a brand new start with a brand new heart today. Everybody is so excited. Your family around you, they're excited for you. So they're going to pray this prayer with you just to encourage you. Online, everybody, would you join in with us as well? Let's all bow our heads. Let's close our eyes. And let's say these words out loud together in faith. Say, Father God, I come to you today in Jesus' name to give you all of my heart and all of my life. Please come into my heart. Be my Lord and my Savior. Forgive me of my sin. Cleanse me with your blood. Wash me in my past and give me a future with you, Lord. For I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he came, he died, and he's raised again to life just for me. Thank you, Jesus. Fill me now with your Holy Spirit and let it be known that from this day on, I am saved. I'm a Christian. I'm born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Can we just give the Lord a praise? Hey, guys, welcome to the family of God. We're so excited for your new life in Jesus Christ. We have some free stuff for you guys, okay? Everybody loves free stuff. We love giving away free stuff, so that's a pretty good relationship already. But my friend, Pastor Joel, right over here, wants to give that to you. Just connect with you for a minute, and then nothing weird's going to go on. You know, sometimes you go to church, you wonder, are they weird? I'm about as weird as it gets today, okay? He's cool. He's going to do that for you, and then he'll let you go, all right? So if you guys just make a left turn, follow Pastor Joel right this way. Come on, let's give him a hand as they go. For those of you that raised your hand but you didn't come forward and you prayed that prayer, 
My goodness, you're still saved. Don't let the devil condemn you and tell you that you're not. On your way out today, we will have some friends that have that same information for you safely out there in the foyer. You can pick that up from them, all right? And uh, that'll be a blessing to you. Make sure to connect with them on your way out at the tables, and that will be wonderful as well online. For those of you that prayed that prayer with us online, you can get all those same materials, those same connections. If you will just wait till after we dismiss the church service, we dismiss by saying that the Inland Empire shall be saved. That's where we live. So maybe you want to put where you live in that place and declare declare that that place will be saved. And then right after that, someone will be on a video telling you how to get a hold of those same materials and those same connections. Remember water baptism right after church. Go jump in the fountain. going to be good for you. Deepen your walk with God. Every step you take with God deepens your experience in your ministry in and through the Lord. And so that's a great place to be right after. And then tonight at six o'clock, we're coming back for church. As the prayer team step forward today, I'm going to pronounce a blessing over you. Would you guys lift your hands to the Lord right now? Father, I bless the saints of God from the top of their heads to the soles of their feet. They are blessed in the city, blessed in the field, blessed coming, blessed going. May everything they put their hands to, they shall prosper. And Lord, with a great big shout of faith, we declare out loud and on purpose that the Inland Empire shall be saved. Hey there, thank you so much for joining us online. What a blast getting to do church with all of you. If you just gave your heart to Jesus and prayed the salvation prayer with our pastor, congratulations and welcome to the family of God. Here at The Rock, we wanna get you plugged in and set up for success with your new walk with God. Now in a moment, I'd like you to head to our Respond to God page so you can fill out some information and we can get in touch with you. We not only wanna give you some free material, but we'd also like to get you hooked up with a friend who can help guide you through your new relationship with God. We have multiple friends available for you in any kind of interaction you'd like, whether that be a Zoom chat, a phone call, email, or any type of COVID-friendly interaction. We've got friends just for you. We have this great little booklet called Welcome to Your Destiny, Easy Steps to a Successful Future with God. If you live within the continental United States, we'd love to get this paper copy in your hands. If you don't live here, don't even worry about it. We've got an electronic copy in PDF format we'd love to get to you as well. We also have this fun little comic book for your kids out there. If any of those kids just gave their heart to Jesus, this comic book is for you. Now it helps explain their new walk with God in a fun sort of age-friendly way that they can understand. Okay, so now what I'd like you to do is go ahead and click on that link provided. And if you can't find a link, don't worry about it. We'll take you to our webpage. Just go to rockchurch.com and click on the Respond to God tab at the bottom right-hand corner. This is gonna take you to a new page where we can get all of your information so we can send you either one of these free copies and we can get you hooked up with a friend who will help walk you through these next steps. Well, it has been wonderful hearing the word of God with you today. We can't wait to see you at our next service. And remember, God loves you and so do we.